The world as we knew it whispered its final elegy, a symphony of rust and ruin, the day the sky bled crimson and the cities fell silent. My name is Asher, and I am a witness to the unraveling of human endeavor, a spectator at the end of the world. The cityscape around me is a haunting mosaic of nature's defiance and mankind's hubris. Towering skyscrapers, once symbols of human ingenuity, now wear cloaks of ivy and moss, their glass facades shattered, reflecting the chaotic beauty of a wild, untamed earth. The streets once bustling with life are quiet, save for the distant howl of a predator, or the rustle of the wind through broken windows. I tread carefully on the cracked asphalt, my boots crunching over debris. Every step is measured, every breath counted. This is not just a city, it is a graveyard of memories and a cradle of the unknown. As I navigate through this urban labyrinth, I can't help but reflect on the events that led us here, the hubris of mankind, believing we could bend nature to our will, and the harsh reality that followed. My destination today is an old community center on the outskirts of what was once a bustling downtown area. Now. It serves as a haven, a makeshift fortress overseen by Rook, the closest thing we have to a leader in these desperate times. As I approach the center, the sound of children playing momentarily slices through the eerie silence, a stark reminder of life's persistence. Rook greets me at the gate, his eyes scanning the horizon with a mixture of caution and curiosity. Anything out there? He asks, his voice a low rumble, almost lost in the wind. Signs of deer... Maybe a few dogs gone feral, I reply, handing him a small bag of herbs I gathered along the way. No sign of other survivors. He nods, his gaze lingering on the horizon a moment longer before turning to me with a serious expression. We need to keep our guard up, Asher. It's not just the animals that have gone wild. I nod, understanding the unspoken truth in his words. Our world is not just undergoing a physical transformation, but a societal one as well. The remnants of humanity are scattered, isolated communities that are as much at odds with each other as they are with the New World Order. Inside the center, I find Mara sorting through a pile of old books and medical supplies. Her presence is calming, a beacon of knowledge and compassion in a world short on both. She looks up, her smile a brief flash of warmth in the cool, musty air of the library. Found something interesting? I ask, glancing at the books. A guide to medicinal plants, she replies, her fingers tracing the faded illustrations. Nature's reclaiming more than just the land, Asher. It's offering us a chance to learn, maybe even to heal. Her words stick with me as I leave the center and head back into the wilderness of concrete and steel. The city is more than just a relic of the past. It's a living museum, a testament to human folly and nature's resilience. As the sun sets, casting long shadows over the twisted metal and broken glass, I can't shake the feeling that we are not just survivors of the apocalypse, but participants in a new beginning. My task, as self-appointed chronicler of this new age, is to document, to remember, and to learn. The echoes of civilization are all around us, whispering secrets of the past, and perhaps hints of the future. As the darkness envelops the city, I make my way back to the community center, my mind racing with the stories of today and the possibilities of tomorrow. This is my testimony, a tale of survival and discovery in a world reborn from the ashes of its own end. And as the night deepens, I realize that our story is just beginning. Morning light seeps through the cracks in the old community center, casting long slender shadows on the dusty floor where we gather. Mara, with her eyes reflecting the calm of dawn, calls me over to the edge of the settlement. Today, she promises, will be a lesson not just in survival, but in the very essence of life that clings on in this new world. As we step outside, the air is fresh with the scent of dew on wild foliage, a stark contrast to the stench of decay that sometimes wafts from the darker corners of the city. Mara leads me through the tangled underbrush to a patch of land that, at first glance, seems swallowed by the untamed growths of post-apocalyptic nature. Look closer, Asher, she instructs, kneeling down, her
Her fingers gently part the leaves, revealing clusters of small, vibrant berries. These are not just remnants of the old world but are signs of adaptation and resilience. Each plant here fights for survival, much like us. I kneel beside her, watching how her hands expertly forage through the foliage, selecting various leaves and berries, storing them in her woven bag. These, she says, holding up a glossy leaf, can treat inflammation. And these berries? High in vitamins. Nature's bounty is rich for those who know where to look. Our morning is spent wandering through what Mara playfully dubs the Green Ghosts, areas where nature has reclaimed the skeletal remains of the city. Each spot tells a story, each plant a character in this new world narrative. You see, Asher, Mara explains as we sit beneath the shadow of an overgrown skyscraper. Before everything fell apart, I spent years studying the medicinal properties of plants in a lab. Now the whole world is my lab. The intimacy of the apocalypse, the way it has stripped back many layers of our former lives, is not lost on me. Here is Mara, a scientist turned sage, finding hope in the heart of despair. Her knowledge, once confined to textbooks and controlled experiments, is now a lifeline woven into the very fabric of our daily survival. As the sun climbs higher, we make our way to a secluded area that Mara has nurtured. Hidden from the casual observer, it's a garden teeming with both wild and cultivated plants. This is our secret, she whispers, a finger pressed to her lips. Rook knows, of course, but few others. It's important to have something worth protecting, something purely ours. The garden is a patchwork quilt of greens and colors, tomatoes hanging from their vines, carrots pushing through the soil, herbs perfuming the air. It's a stark oasis amid the desolation. Here, amidst the rows of nurturing growth, Mara not only teaches me about plants, but also about resilience. Our bodies and spirits need nourishment, she says, plucking a ripe tomato and handing it to me. The juice bursts sweet and tangy, a vivid reminder of life's continuance. We spend the afternoon tending to the garden, pulling weeds and discussing plans for expanding our hidden haven. The physical work is grounding, a reminder that despite the world's end, we can cultivate new beginnings from the soil of the old. As dusk approaches and we prepare to head back, Mara stops by a particularly lush bush. This, she says, tugging gently at a vine, is nightshade, beautiful but deadly. It's a reminder that not all that grows after such devastation is benign. Our walk back is quiet, contemplative. The city, with its crumbling facades and nature's encroaching grip seems less like a tomb and more like a cradle of the new world, whispering secrets of survival to those willing to listen. Back at the community center, I jot down notes from the day, a testament to the lessons learned and the hope gathered. Tonight, I write not just of survival, but of the life that persists in the heart of the green ghosts, where even in the world's end, there are beginnings. As the night deepens and the stars peek through the ragged veil of the atmosphere, my thoughts drift to the morrow. What mysteries do the static-filled whispers of old radios hold? What new lessons await in the ruins of civilization? This is my testimony, a record of rebirth amid ruins, a story of learning to see not just with the eyes, but with the heart. And as I seal my notes and look up at the stars, I realize that even in the darkness there is light to be found. The dawn was just breaking, casting a pale orange glow over the dilapidated skyline of the city, when Mara and I stumbled upon an unexpected relic of the old world. Nestled among the rubble of a collapsed building, partially hidden by a thicket of overgrown ivy, was an old radio, its case cracked, but the dial still faintly glowing. Its soft, static hum was like the whisper of the past, trying to speak through the silence of desolation. Do you think it still works? I asked Mara, brushing the dirt off its surface with cautious reverence. Only one way to find out, she replied, her voice tinged with a mix of curiosity and nostalgia. We had both grown up in a world filled with such devices. Now to find one here seemed like a message, a sign. 
We spent the morning clearing the debris around it, setting up a makeshift antenna from some old wire we found nearby. As Mara tinkered with the knobs, the static gave way intermittently to fragments of broadcasts, old music, snippets of news from days long forgotten. And then, a voice, clear and deliberate. If anyone is out there, you're not alone. The transmission was weak, fading in and out like the heartbeat of the old world. But it was enough. It sparked a new kind of hope in us. Or perhaps it was the ancient human instinct to connect, to find others in the vastness of desolation that propelled us. We need to find where it's coming from, I declared, more to the wind than to Mara. But she nodded, her eyes alight with the fire of determination. The signal was weak, which meant the source couldn't be far. We planned quickly, gathering supplies for a journey through the city. If there were others out there, it was worth every risk to find them. Leaving the safety of the community center behind, we ventured deeper into the city than we had before. The landscape bore the scars of nature's reclaiming. Vines draped over crumbling facades, trees burst through the foundations of buildings, and wild animals watched us with cautious eyes from the shadows. As we moved, I kept the portable radio close, headphones clamped over my ears, listening for any change in the signal. Mara mapped our path, marking the safe zones we knew, and the dangerous ones marked by signs of the feral packs, or the unstable structures ready to collapse. The journey was silent, except for the crunch of our boots and the occasional static crackle in my ears, a reminder of our purpose. We stopped frequently, adjusting our direction as the signal strengthened, leading us like a beacon. We arrived at an old library, its once grand structure now a skeleton of its former glory. The signal was strongest here, emanating from somewhere inside. The door was ajar, swinging gently in the wind, its creaks a ghostly welcome. Inside, the air was thick with dust and the smell of mold. Shelves, once lined with books, now lay in disarray, their contents spilled like the thoughts of a bygone era scattered on the floor. We moved cautiously, the static in the headphones growing ever more insistent, a voice cutting in and out, an urgent plea repeated over and over. Come to the roof if you can hear this. We have... The message was never complete, always snatched away by the whine of static at the crucial moment. We made our way to the stairwell, the steps groaning under our weight, a testament to the years they had endured without care. Reaching the roof, the city opened up before us, a vista of destruction and wild beauty. And there, across the expanse, atop another building, was the source of the signal. A small makeshift antenna rigged with all manner of scrap and standing next to it, silhouetted against the rising sun, was a figure, waving. We waved back, our hearts pounding not just from the climb but from the realization that we were indeed not alone. The figure, distant yet unmistakably human, beckoned. As we prepared to make our way across to them, a sudden crackle in the headphones gave way to a clear, stern warning, chilling despite the morning sun warming our backs. Be cautious, Asher, the voice said, so suddenly clear so unexpectedly familiar. I froze, recognizing the voice, though I had never heard it through the static before. It was Whisper, the enigmatic figure known to roam the wilds, their knowledge of the cataclysm as deep as it was chilling. They are not what they seem, the voice continued before drowning once again in static. Mara looked at me, her expression a mix of confusion and concern. Do we go on? She asked, her hand resting on the old binoculars slung around her neck, ready to scout the path ahead. Yes, I said after a moment, my voice firm with resolve. We need to know more. We need to find out who they are, and what whisper meant. So, with cautious steps and wary hearts, we moved forward towards the new unknown, our journey through the ruins now cast in the shadows of secrets yet untold. This was more than just survival. This was the search for truth in a world shrouded in mystery and betrayal. And as we crossed the threshold into new territory, the old world whispered its warnings and its wisdom, carried on the air that moved through the desolate cityscape. 
The early morning sun cast long shadows across the debris-strewn streets as Mara and I made our cautious approach toward the building from which the mysterious figure had signaled. The city around us was a ruinous maze, its once vibrant life reduced to whispers of wind through shattered glass and overgrown alleys. With each step, the weight of Whisper's warning pressed heavily upon us, mingling with the static-laden messages still echoing in the radio clutched tightly in my hand. Keep your eyes open, Asher, Mara murmured, her gaze scanning the skeletal remains of downtown skyscrapers surrounding us. Her hand rested on the hilt of a makeshift knife, a stark reminder of the dangers not just from the potential deceit awaiting us, but from the very environment we traversed. As we neared the building, the signal grew stronger, clearer. It was a direct call to action, a beacon that promised either new allies or a trap laid by unknown foes. The voice through the radio crackled again. Rooftop clear, approach with caution. We entered the building, its lobby choked with vines and littered with the detritus of a hurried evacuation. The air was thick with the musty scent of decay, papers fluttering in the breeze like the wings of birds long gone. The stairwell was dark, each step upwards a plunge deeper into the unknown. At the rooftop door, we paused, listening. The city seemed to hold its breath with us, the only sound the distant call of a bird of prey. Mara nodded at me, and I pushed the door open. The rooftop revealed a garden of sorts, an oasis amidst desolation. Containers of vegetables and herbs thrived, fed by a makeshift irrigation system. And there, in the center of this unexpected sanctuary, stood not one, but three figures. Their leader, a woman with sharp eyes and a stance that spoke of both authority and exhaustion, stepped forward. I'm Lena, she said, her voice firm. You heard our broadcast? Yes, I replied, my hand still on the radio at my belt. We came looking for other survivors. Mara stepped beside me, her presence reassuring. We're cautious, she added. We've had our share of troubles with misunderstandings. Lena nodded, a wry smile briefly crossing her features. Understandable, the world isn't what it was. She gestured to her companions, a young man with wary eyes and an older man whose hands were stained with soil. We're all that's left of a community from the east side. The gardens keep us alive. The conversation was cut short by a sudden disturbance from the access door. We all turned, reaching for whatever weapons we had. A shadow detached itself from the stairwell, moving with deliberate slowness. It was Whisper. Careful. Whisper's voice was low, a stark contrast to the static-filled warnings from before. Not everything is as it seems. Lena and her group tensed, recognition dawning in their eyes. You know this person? I asked, my gaze flicking between the newcomer and our hosts. Yes, Lena replied, her voice tight. Whisper warned us of a danger lurking beneath the city. Something from before. Whisper stepped fully into the sunlight, their eyes scanning the rooftop garden and its occupants. The danger is real, they said, addressing us all. Below this building lies one of the old government labs. When everything fell apart, they were working on something hazardous. It's starting to leak. Mara's eyes widened. A lab here? Could it be related to the collapse? Possibly, Whisper confirmed. They pointed to a corner of the rooftop where a rusted hatch lay partially obscured by foliage. This leads down to the labs. I believe it's time the full truth was uncovered to prevent further calamity. The revelation hung heavy in the air. Lena exchanged a look with her companions, then nodded at us. We've sensed tremors, smelled chemicals at night. We knew something was off, but didn't have the means to investigate. Then we'll go together, I declared, feeling the resolve solidify within me. We need to know what's down there, and if it's a threat, we need to contain it. Mara squeezed my arm, her determination mirroring my own. Let's uncover the shadows of the past, she said. Together, with Lena's group and Whisper as our uneasy guide, we prepared to descend into the bowels of the earth. The hatch creaked open, revealing a ladder that disappeared into the darkness below. One by one we descended, leaving the deceptive safety of the sunlight for the secrets that lay shrouded in the depths of the city.
As I climbed down into the darkness, the radio crackled one last time. A faint voice lost in static. A reminder of the fragile thread connecting us to other souls across the shattered city. This was more than a journey for survival, it was a quest for truth, one that might change the very foundation of what it meant to survive in this new world. Our descent into the shadows was a plunge into the unknown, a journey not just through physical darkness, but through the murky past of human endeavor and error. What lay below could be the key to understanding not just the fall of civilization, but perhaps the way forward. This was my testimony, a chronicle of the descent not just into the earth, but into the heart of human folly and hope. As we ventured deeper, the echoes of the past whispered around us, ready to reveal their long-guarded secrets. The clanking of the rusty ladder echoed through the dimly lit shaft as we descended into the bowels of the old government laboratory. The air grew colder and denser, filled with the musty aroma of disuse and decay. As we reached the bottom, the narrow beam of our flashlights revealed a corridor lined with cracked tiles and peeling paint, whispering tales of haste and abandonment. Mara gripped her flashlight tighter, casting its light on faded hazard signs that seemed almost ironic in the eerie silence. This place feels like a tomb, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the soft drip of water from the leaking ceiling. It's more than that, Whisper replied, stepping forward to lead the way. It's a reminder of hubris, of what happens when power is unchecked and fear drives decisions. The corridor opened into a larger hall, the center of which held remnants of what appeared to be a control room. Banks of computers and equipment were strewn about, screens dark and lifeless. In the glow of our flashlights, shadows seemed to dance on the walls, creating fleeting illusions of movement. Lena, who had been quiet during the descent, now stepped up beside me. We used to hear rumors, she said, her voice steady but tinged with unease. Rumors about experiments, things not meant for the world outside. When the collapse came, we thought it was all over. Whisper led us to a sealed door at the far end of the room. This is it, they announced, pointing to a keypad smeared with grime. Beyond this door lies what they were trying to contain. Mara examined the keypad, her fingers deftly working to clear the interface. I can try to bypass the lock, she offered, pulling a small tool set from her bag. As she worked, the tension among us grew palpable. Each click of the keypad seemed to resonate through the vast emptiness of the underground facility. Finally, with a soft beep, the lock disengaged, and the door slowly swung open. We were met with a blast of chilled air and a foul stench that made us cover our noses. The room beyond was unlike any other part of the lab we had seen. Large cylindrical tanks lined the walls, connected by a maze of piping and cables. In the dim light, we could see that some tanks were cracked, their contents long since drained away. It's a bio lab, Whisper explained, their voice grim. They were experimenting with pathogens, trying to develop biological weapons. When the collapse happened, the safety protocols failed. Everything went into lockdown, but not before some of the substances were released into the air vents. A sense of dread settled over the group. Lena looked around nervously. Is it still a threat? She asked, her hand subconsciously moving toward her mouth. Whisper nodded toward a digital readout on the wall. The air is clear now, but the danger isn't just biological. There's something else. I followed Whisper's flashlight beam to a terminal that still flickered weakly. Let's see if we can access the logs, I suggested, hoping to find more answers. Together, Mara and I approached the terminal. She rebooted the system, and after a tense few moments, the screen lit up with lines of code and logs. Scrolling through the entries, we uncovered a disturbing timeline of experiments and failures, each more desperate than the last. The last entries are concerning, Mara pointed out. They mention a critical containment failure and an evacuation protocol, but there's no record of whether the protocol was successful. As we digested the information, a low rumbling echoed through the facility, the ground beneath our feet vibrating subtly. We need to leave, Whisper urged, 
their eyes wide with sudden fear. Now! We didn't need further prompting. Turning on our heels, we raced back the way we came, the ominous rumbling growing louder, accompanied by the sound of collapsing masonry and the hiss of escaping gas. The escape was frantic, a blur of sprinting shadows and flashing lights as we navigated the labyrinthine corridors. Behind us, the structure groaned under the stress of whatever had been unleashed. Bursting out into the open air, we took deep, ragged breaths, the night sky a blanket of stars above us, indifferent to the chaos below. We had escaped the immediate danger, but the revelations of the lab hung over us like a dark cloud. We uncovered the truth, but at what cost? I pondered aloud, watching as the others gathered around, faces drawn and pale in the moonlight. Whisper, looking back toward the lab's entrance, which now emitted thin wisps of smoke, responded solemnly, The cost of ignorance is often high. Now we know, and knowing gives us a chance to make things right. As we made our way back to our community, the weight of our discovery pressed down on us. We had found the heart of darkness within the city, a legacy of the old world that threatened to reach into the future. But with the truth revealed, we had the power to forge a new path, one that recognized and respected the fine line between use and misuse of science. This was our new dawn, a beginning forged in the shadow of past mistakes, with the hope that we might learn from them and move forward, not just to survive, but to thrive. This was my testimony, a tale of darkness and light, of descent into the past and the climb toward a better tomorrow. As the city slept and the first hints of dawn painted the sky, I realized that our story was far from over. It was just another chapter in the long, arduous journey of humanity. As we emerged from the subterranean darkness, the chill of the laboratory was replaced by the tepid air of the night. Our group was silent, each of us processing the horrors we had just uncovered below the city. The truth about the experiments was more disturbing than any of us had anticipated, and the reality of the situation weighed heavily on our shoulders. We can't let this stay buried, I murmured, as we gathered outside the hatch. The stars overhead were obscured by a veil of clouds, mirroring the murky ethical waters we now found ourselves in. Mara nodded solemnly, her face etched with resolve. We need to document everything we saw. If there are other facilities like this, people need to be warned. Whispers stood apart, their gaze distant. There are more secrets. They finally spoke, their voice a low echo in the quiet of the night. This was just the surface. The true heart of the catastrophe is deeper, woven into the very fabric of the collapse. Their words sent a shiver down my spine. We had discovered a layer of truth, but it was clear that more was hidden away, perhaps deeper and darker than what we had just witnessed. Determined to uncover the full extent of the cataclysm, we planned our next move. We decided to access the central data repository indicated in the laboratory's network, a hub that supposedly contained detailed records of every experiment conducted across multiple facilities. The journey to the data repository took us through the city's forgotten sectors, areas that had once been vibrant hubs of activity but were now nothing more than ghostly corridors of decay. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the occasional drip of water or the distant call of a night creature. The repository was located beneath a building that had once been a government facility, its facade grandiose, now crumbled and taken over by ivy and moss. The entrance was sealed, but with Whisper's guidance and Mara's technical expertise, we managed to gain access. Inside, the air was stale, the smell of old paper and dust overwhelming. The facility was vast rows upon rows of servers and data storage units lined the walls, all coated in a thick layer of dust. Mara set up a makeshift workstation and began interfacing with the system. After several tense minutes, the screens flickered to life, illuminating the dark room with a cold blue light. We watched, holding our breath, as Mara navigated through directories filled with encrypted files and classified information. The data was a Pandora's box, revealing the scope of human arrogance and folly. Experiments not just biological, but chemical and physical had been tampered with, 
boundaries pushed in the name of progress. The environmental exploitation was staggering, a series of decisions made with catastrophic consequences, all meticulously documented in cold, bureaucratic language. As we delved deeper, we uncovered a series of communications between top officials that painted a chilling picture. The collapse had been precipitated not just by the experiments themselves, but by a catastrophic failure to contain their effects when they spiraled out of control. The final piece of the puzzle was a series of logs from an emergency meeting held just days before the collapse. The scientists and officials had known the risks, but their greed and desperation had blinded them to the imminent danger. We need to share this with everyone, I said, the weight of responsibility heavy in my voice. The world needs to know not just to understand the past, but to avoid repeating these mistakes. Agreement was unanimous. We compiled the data, downloading as much as we could onto portable drives. The return to the surface was somber, each of us lost in thought. The weight of our discovery a somber cloak around our shoulders. Back at Rook's community, we called a meeting, presenting our findings to the group. The impact was immediate, a mixture of shock, anger, and deep sadness. Rook, ever the leader, stood and addressed the community with a gravitas born of the moment. This knowledge gives us power, he said, his voice resolute. Power to change, to rebuild not just our community, but how we interact with the world. We've been given a second chance, and we must use it wisely. The days that followed were a blur of activity. We established a communication network using old radio equipment, reaching out to other communities, sharing our findings, warning them, and offering them the chance to join us in forging a new path. As I lay down each night, the data we had uncovered replayed in my mind, a relentless reminder of human potential for both creation and destruction. But amidst the darkness of those revelations, there was a glimmer of hope, a chance for redemption and rebirth. This was our new reality, a world built on the ruins of the old, informed by the mistakes of the past, but driven by the hope of a better future. Our story was one of resilience, of rising from the ashes to reclaim our humanity in a world reborn. And as the dawn of a new day broke over the city, I continued to write, to record our journey, our lessons, and our hopes. This was not just my testimony, but a manifesto for the future, a guide for those who would one day read our story and learn from our journey through the shadows. And with each word I wrote, I believed, perhaps for the first time, that the end of the world was not the end of everything. It was just the beginning of something new. The pale light of dawn crept over the horizon as our weary group made its way back to Rook's community. The revelations from the underground lab had shaken us to our cores, yet within me stirred a cautious optimism fueled by the boundless potential for change. The secrets we had unearthed were grim, but they were also a beacon guiding us towards a future we could shape into something better. As we approached the gates, the first rays of sunlight pierced the mist, casting long shadows across the ground. Rook was waiting for us, his presence steadfast and reassuring. Behind him, the community had gathered, their faces etched with a mix of hope and apprehension. We've discovered truths that change everything, I began, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. The downfall we've blamed on nature's fury was also a product of human error, of greed and unchecked ambition. Murmurs of shock and disbelief rippled through the crowd, but Rook raised his hand to silence them. Let Asher speak, he commanded, his gaze sweeping over his people with a gravitas that demanded attention. I continued, strengthened by Rook's support. The facility beneath the city was just one of many, each a testament to the dangers of pushing science beyond ethical boundaries. We now hold the knowledge of these failures not to frighten you, but to arm us with the power to prevent history from repeating itself. Whisper stepped forward, their mysterious aura undiminished even in the revealing light of day. This information does not spell the end but a beginning. With it, we can educate, prepare, and rebuild not just our community, but also our conscience. The community listened, rapt, as Mara distributed copies of the digital files we had extracted. 
These files contain data from the labs, she explained. They show everything from the environmental damage caused to potential solutions that were never implemented. It's time we use this knowledge wisely. Discussion broke out among the groups, with people expressing fear, anger, but also hope. Rook, ever the leader, called for order. This is a lot to process, and it will take time to fully understand the implications. But know this, we are no longer mere survivors, we are pioneers of a new world. In the days that followed, we organized meetings to debate our next steps. Engineers and scientists within the community came forward, keen to devise plans to harness the untapped technologies for sustainability rather than destruction. Educators proposed curriculums that would teach not only survival, but also stewardship of the earth. I took it upon myself to document everything, compiling our findings, the discussions, and the emerging plans into a comprehensive archive. This document, I decided, would not be just a record, but a manifesto for future generations, a guide to prevent them from stumbling down the paths that led us to near ruin. The season turned as we toiled, and with the onset of spring, a palpable change swept through the community. Gardens flourished, new structures rose, and a new curriculum took shape. Children learned about solar energy, water filtration, and the importance of biodiversity alongside math and history. One evening, as the sun set on a day filled with labor and learning, Mara approached me. You've been the chronicler of our darkest times, she said softly, and now you'll document our brightest. Together, we walked through the community, observing the tangible results of our newfound direction. The air was filled with the sounds of construction and laughter, the energy of a community not just surviving, but thriving. This is our new dawn, I said, more to myself than to Mara, feeling a profound connection to the rebirth around me. Our chance to mend what was broken, to right the wrongs of the past, and to forge a path of respect and harmony with the world that sustains us. That night, under a canopy of stars, I completed my testimony. It was a tale of destruction and rebirth, of despair and hope. It was a story of a people who faced the end of the world they knew, and instead of succumbing to despair, chose to build a new world from the ashes of the old. As I sealed the final entry, I realized that while my testimony was ending, our true story was just beginning. A story no longer just of survival, but of revival. With the dawn, we would face new challenges, but armed with knowledge and fueled by a united purpose, we were ready to meet them head on. This was not just the end, but also a beginning. The first chapter of a new era for humanity, written not with whispers of fear, but with declarations of hope. <laughs>